she is. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone. So apologies for those technical difficulties. Um, we have our March 2nd council committee meeting. Roll call show that all councilors, March 6th. Oh, sorry. I've been, yeah, I've been having a week. Anyways, uh, March 6th council committee meeting. Roll call shows that all councilors are present. Uh, Councilor Chair Perry is joining us live via satellite on the Zoom. So, <laughs> location. So please be angry and jealous at him. Um, I do want to quickly make a comment about the change in the agenda in consultation with Councilor Chair Perry today. Um, I asked that there be a public uh, comment session included at the beginning um, or an opportunity for the public to comment on a particular item that I know folks are here to talk about. Normally, just so that you know, there's an opportunity at every committee meeting to comment on every item on every agenda. Um, but we wanted to make sure to carve out some special time for that. So uh, folks may have been confused to see a change in agenda so shortly before a meeting, but it was not a substantive change to the process other than just to make space for the reason that I imagine most of you are here today. Um, all right, so to move on to item number two, Council rights and responsibilities in labor relations uh, matters. Um, before we open up to uh, hear from folks who came to speak tonight, um, I wanna start off by reading a statement that um, the majority of council workshopped um, to represent um, the information that's available to us that we can share with the public. Um, so I wanna begin by stressing that town councilors have a responsibility to not comment in favor of or in opposition to the formation of a union by town employees. Maine labor law is clear on this. All town employees have the right to join or not join a union free from coercion or intimidation of any kind. What I can talk about is the process itself. Council has received a lot of feedback from community members on this topic, and it's clear from the content of these messages that there has been miscommunication or misunderstanding of what has happened and why. Most importantly, there is a mistaken belief circulating that the town has filed a petition with the Labor Relations Board to prevent town employees from forming a union or that the town is opposing that union. That is simply not the case. The American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees filed a petition on behalf of a number of town employees who want to form a union. The makeup of a union, of any union, is guided by state statute and any gray areas are negotiated. This is standard labor practice. When a petition like this is filed, the town is required to respond within a reasonable amount of time. Otherwise, the town forfeits the right to negotiate any aspect of the petition. This particular petition contains several discrepancies that did not align with state law, specifically around what positions can and cannot be included and whether or not the petitioners had enough community of interest to be included in the same bargaining unit. And I, again, want to point out, as the town manager reminded me, um, that uh, the town responding to the petition is part of what opens up the, ne the negotiation bargaining practice in the formation of a union. The narrative circulating in the community paints the picture of council ignoring its responsibilities or being left out of the loop while staff hired an attorney for the express purpose of stopping this union from forming. This is just not the case. The town's response was not only standard practice, but we routinely receive legal advice around labor relations as the town already includes two other unions. Legally, council has no role to play in this stage of the process whatsoever. We do not vote on whether or not to support the formation of a union because again, we must protect our workers' rights by remaining neutral and non-coercive. And the council also doesn't have the right to intrude on employment or personnel issues that is outlined in our charter. But most importantly, the town itself cannot prevent its employees from forming a union. It can only respond to the petition and attempt to negotiate how the union is formed. Ultimately, it will not be the town manager or the attorney or the town council who decide whether this union exists. It is the decision of the town's covered employees and the main labor relations board. 
The council cannot be involved in this until a union actually exists, at which point it would have a role in the normal bargaining process as it already does with police and fire. Finally, and I want to stress this because it is very important. There have been accusations from members of the public that our town manager is operating in bad faith, attempting to prevent the formation of the union without council's knowledge or consent. This is emphatically not true. We have hired our town manager to follow the law Deciding whether or not to follow the law should not be up to a council vote. The manager's actions are in keeping with the law and the job that council has hired her to do. Furthermore, had the town manager not challenged the parts of the petition that don't align with state statute, if she hadn't done it, she wouldn't be doing her job, quite simply. We believe that in this community, people are reasonable and good. Please do let your voice be heard and your opinions about these important issues be known but let's please also engage in thoughtful, reasonable discourse. Let us be respectful of one another and give each other the grace to allow this process to play out. Most importantly, let us give each other the benefit of the doubt that we are all people who care deeply about this community and what's best for it. So with that, I do wanna open it up to the public um, to give comment. I do want to remind folks that um, typically with public comment, one of the a few things that we tend to say to folks is like, please do try not to be repetitive, whether in your own comments or by repeating comments that others have already made. Um, please do try to limit yourself to a reasonable amount of time, knowing that you know we have a full room and we also do have items on our agenda after this. Um, the third thing that I will say specific to this public comment is, Again, in referencing some of the emails we received that made some pretty unfair accusations specifically directed at the town manager that we're just not going to tolerate, you know, um, those kinds of criticisms, direct criticisms of her. She is a town employee and all town employees have rights. Um, the town council speaks about personnel issues with the town manager pertaining to her in executive session, and it's part of our job to do that this isn't the forum uh, for that conversation. So I'm gonna be pretty, pretty short about that one. But in general, we've been looking forward to hear what folks have to say. Um, as Bell reminded you, the microphones pick up everything. So I don't know if folks feel comfortable standing up. And do remember when you give comment that the habit is to identify yourself and um, sometimes people say where they live, but anyway. Um, so with that, that floor is open. Floor is open. Sure. Um, Mark Haggerty. Uh, some of you I know, some of you I don't know. Uh, my first comment I want to make is thank you, Tom Perry. I had the privilege of serving the town council with you. Sorry not to have you here today. Um, Mark. So why I'm here today is my concern for the town of Werno, my concern about transparency, more significantly, the lack of perceived transparency in the town, town manager and council. So as was noted, there's all these rumors flooding around. So you're not doing something right. Right? When all those rumors are out and about, you need to do something better with respect to that. Uh, in a prior existence, I actually got a PhD in economics, labor, labor relationships, okay? So I have some expertise in this or did, or could pretend to. And the one thing I do know is that people don't unionize because they just want to. They unionize because they feel the need to. And unionization comes at a cost. Unionization comes with threats to job security, even if they're just perceived. They come with a lot of threats involved with them. So to have town employees decide to fill out cards to want to unionize, while I emphatically support that, being a past union member many times myself, I support unions. I would 
ask town council to think about what's happening with your employees, what's happening with the management of your employees, if they feel threatened, threatened enough to overcome the threats to their job security by trying to unionize. I don't know what's going on. I don't know the story, but I do know that. If you want to become a union, there's a reason. And you should be, as town council, it is your responsibility to take care of the town and the employees, and you manage the town manager. It's your obligation to make sure things are being managed correctly. So I'm going to ask you to pay attention to that. And I would actually like, while you have said there were very few objections, are they a public record? Can you make the record to all of the so objections were made to the cards and who should be unionized? So Matt is that is, public? Matt, Matt is behind. He is on. Oh, okay. He just needs to turn his camera on. Because that would really go a step towards transparency. I've talked to the AFL CIO, and they presented a very different comment than when I talked to Sophie two hours ago. So, so the I'm not sure what reality is, but so our attorney can clear. maybe speak to to that. Matt, did you hear the question? Yes, I did. I think the question is whether or not the uh, town's petition response is a public document. I believe it is. Matt, can you two things? Bell, can you turn Matt up? And Matt, can you go through because what um, Mr. Haggerty is concerned about is that the response, what he has heard from the AFL-CIO is that our response is, is trying to kick everybody out so that there really isn't a union left. So he has asked if you would go through our response and just say what it is. I don't think we... So they, I can't turn Matt up. Okay. That just has to lean forward. Let me see if I can turn my own microphone up. How's this? Is this better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can't respond to what the AFL-CIO attorney says, and I'm surprised that anyone would opine on something they hadn't reviewed first as an attorney. But um, there, the uh, town's response, which I believe is a public record, is pretty straightforward. Um, there are categories of employees who um, that that, uh, that were. Uh, in the uh, petition that there are statutory exclusions for them from joining a, any union because they're not defined as public employees as that term is defined under the statute. That's, that's black and white. Um, we also, there's also a question regarding whether or not certain of the employees have a community of interest with each other. Some of them are, as, as their job descriptions describe them, are professional employees, while others are uh, clerical type employees. And there's a question about, about whether or not they share a community of interest that they should be in a union together. That doesn't mean that they won't be in a union. It just mean, might mean they not, not, might not be in the same union. And the third general category of, uh, of uh, the response was that the petition covers several part-time employees. And um, that is typically a, a issue you raise in a, a petition response because there is no defined parameter of, of how part-time somebody has to be in order to be part of the union. And the example I would give will maybe seem like a silly one, but if somebody works one hour a month for the town, do they have a community of interest with everybody else who works 40 hours a week? So that's a question that you raise with the labor board and it will be a, a topic of discussion. Thank you. Will you make that document? <clears throat> if it is public, will you post it someplace? Because this is one of the concerns because in the literature, this is kind of classic union busting. This is how we keep unions, very particular language in the literature. 
This is how we keep unions from being formed. And I don't want to be in a town that's anti-union. I also just want to remind folks of the timeline of this. Like we, uh, this, this document, it's only been, it was what, Thursday? What, Wednesday? Wednesday at like 5 p.m. Wednesday, 5 p.m. would have been received by the town attorney, the town manager. There's, or, no, that's when we submitted it. When you submitted it, right, okay. So Wednesday, 5 p.m. Um, I believe that people involved in the petition would have been able to see it by Thursday, possibly. It seems like it was shared. Uh, it was Friday that we started getting emails from the public and received a couple over the weekend. So when we talk about the timeline and like rumors flying, this is all a very quick timeline. The document was submitted Wednesday night. We, it seems like petitioners had access to it on Thursday. We started hearing from the public Friday afternoon um, and over the weekend a little bit. So it's, this is all happening very quickly for all of us. Just So Matt, what do you think about posting our response? <clears throat> I believe it's a public document. I don't think it's any any problem with posting it. Okay, sounds like we can do that. Uh, yes, did you want to comment? I just want to ask a question. If I might. Sure, my do you mind Debbie introducing Abram. yourself for the camera? Yep, my name is Debbie Abram. Can we go back to your first point, Matt, about how somebody doesn't qualify as a public employee? How can someone work for the town and not qualify as a public employee? That that's, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's a reason, but that seems. How can somebody work for the town and not be a public employee? That looks that's, frozen. That's a great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, frozen. So we still have it. He's still up. Oh, Bell's reconnecting. Yeah, it's the, the internet just went down. Mine is restarting too. Is, is there any way when we get back to going that like the, the speakers that are on that side of the room can be on for him as well or no? Maybe. Just to make it louder. But probably not tonight. Oh, okay. What do you want to turn on? Speakers. It's still hard to hear Matt. It's, I have him on my headphones and he's just super duper hard to hear. Okay. It's he was like microphone. really, really easy to hear on the other side. It's his microphone now. Oh. Because I think he's also having connection issues. Okay. Uh, he's connected up here. He's just not connected right here. But he's on this screen. So this one isn't a touch screen like our old one. Okay. Okay. We're good. Got it. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Just barely, but we can hear you. Okay. If you move forward, does that help? Okay, I'll try and speak loudly. Um, that's a great question. Um, the uh, joining a public sector union for municipal employees in Maine is governed by the Maine Public Employees Labor Relations Act. And in that act, they have a, def a definition section and they define public employees in a number of ways. They also define who is not a public employee for labor relations purposes and therefore cannot join a union. And so if, um, so, the typical somebody works for the town or a public employee is not how the Labor Act defines somebody as being a public employee. And I give you an example. If somebody has not worked for the town for six months under the Labor Act, they are not a public employee and they cannot do it. Can you hear me now? Wow. So, yep, we can hear you, Matt. Okay, so there are any number of categories of employees who under the Labor Act are not defined as public employees and therefore not permitted to join a union. And that's what we've pointed out in the town's response to the petition, that there are a number of positions that have been categorized who are not uh, public employees as that term is defined under the Labor Act. So, Matt, another example might be um, department or division heads are right. not. <laughs> department or division heads, uh, employees who are appointed for a, um, for a, by, by the town for a period of one year or less. Um, and so any number of, there are, there are probably 10 or 11 categories of, of employees who are not considered public employees. 
And again, that's what we raised in the petition or, or the union petition describes positions and has employees who are not um, eligible, at least in our analysis, to join the union. That doesn't mean that the town objects to the union or opposes the union. It just means that the law doesn't permit certain categories to belong in a union. Do you have a follow-up? I do. If, if when the town employees who are eligible to unionize do unionize, does that uh, employee union then represent all the employees, including the ones who can't join? Because I know that when I worked in a school system, you were represented by the union, whether you were a member or not. I think what you're saying, what you described is, if there is a recognition clause in a contract that includes certain positions in a, uh, a union, then those employees who join the union to decide not to join the union are still covered by the contract. But here, if the recognition clause by the, by the labor board, once this uh, is all sorted out, determines that certain employees don't, are not in the union, they're not recognized and they will not be covered by the union. They're, because they're, they're, by statute, they're not permitted to be in a union. And again, Matt, so you're saying that is determined by the labor board, not anything yeah. to do with the town. Right. right. That's correct. So, Thank you. Do other folks have questions, comments they want to give? Sarah? I'm Sarah Marks. Um, I have a question. I need to. So I've been looking at the Sarah. I can't hear you, Sarah. Oh, I think they're, the, mic, the mic's not picking you up. What do I need to do? Maybe just a little louder. OK, can you hear me now, Tom? Yes. OK, sorry, I'll try. Um, I've been looking at the labor law, and I have a couple questions. Um, one is, it was my understanding and reading the law, I can clearly find where the public employer who I believe the council is the public employer um, in the labor law I'm looking at, it's 1 MRSA 269A. And I can clearly see that the public employer can accept the union, but I can't find the labor law you all are citing that says that you are required by law to file your objections to CART. What is that law? Can you cite that for me? Matt, did you hear that question? Yeah, I think there was a question about, you know, what statute. The, um, first of all, the, uh, the Labor law and the, and the town's labor response is governed by the town manager plan, and this is her, uh, the town manager's responsibility to, uh, in, in fiduciary duty to the town, to raise objections or raise responses to, th to positions that don't um, belong. The Labor Relations Act is um, cont also contains rules about the town's response. And I think the, the question here is whether the town has an obligation to object to every position. And I think the answer is no, it doesn't have an obligation to do so, but I think it would be a dereliction of the, of the town's duty not to do so, not to raise the, the issue in front of the labor board as to, it, as to positions that don't belong in the union. And I'll give you a quick example. If the union in this petition had, had petitioned to say the town manager should be a part of this union, the, the town certainly would have raised an objection because the town manager clearly by statute should not be in it. And so the same goes with the other positions. Positions that by statutes don't belong in a union have to be raised. Otherwise the town waives its position in other way to, uh, to raise that objection. Sarah? Thanks. Um, I just had a follow-up question. I totally understand about the positions that just don't qualify to be in the union. Um, but am I understanding correctly that there are different categories? I understand the first category is the ones that don't qualify because maybe they are a manager position who supervises people or maybe they're a contract employee. I don't know every one of those categories. But am I correct that the professional versus clerical distinction and that the part-time versus full-time 
Those are not required objections, correct? Those are optional objections? They are. The, the, uh, okay. the objection regarding professional versus um, clerical is, a, is something that we raised to the, to the labor board to point out that people may, these people in those categories, those categories don't have a community of interest. That is something that the labor board examines and determine a union. It doesn't mean that those employees might, will not be in a union. It just means that they may not be in the, in the same union because they don't have a community of interest with each other because they have different types of jobs and responsibilities. And that's an analysis that you, you, you make through the labor board. So we raise that because it is a factor that the labor board looks at. And with the, and, and again, I, I think I earlier said why the uh, part-time was uh, raised because there is no defined or agreement between the town and the and a union as what that means. Again, it could person could work for the town one hour a year and they are in the union. That, that that's the type of thing that typically, at between the union and the town, eventually, I mean, you'll have a, a discussion about what that means. Let's have some clarification. So that's more of a point of clarification than anything else. So the town is or is not objecting to those. Are they asking for clarification? So or I think. Maybe it would be helpful because I, I'm a lay person trying to wrap my head around all of this as well to explain, and, I, and our attorney can correct me if I get this wrong, but the general idea in layperson's terms is the employees file their petition saying we want a union and we want it to be like this. The town has 15 days to look at that and then file a response saying, well, that's illegal under statute or that there's no definition for part-time and we don't agree that clerical and professional should be in the same union and submits that to the labor board. So this is all submitted to the labor board. The labor board, that allows the conversation to happen. That is what allows the negotiation of what the contract could potentially look like. And it's up to the labor board to weigh in on those things. So for the town to not say anything and just let whatever was submitted go, means that there's no opportunity to actually discuss how this formation would work. How the, how, so for example, we can say, can you take a look at defining part-time? Can you take a look at the difference between clerical and professional? It's the labor board that will look at those things. The town is asking for the negotiation process. The first step is that the labor board, the town and the union come together and talk about each of the areas that the town has raised, if the labor, if there are good reasons why the town shouldn't be in that position, the town would say, okay, that's a good reason. But my experience negotiating contracts, we have two contracts with public safety. They both do public safety. I would not be able to effectively manage those two contracts if they were combined as one. They have very different terms recognizing that they do different things. So the entire, the, the way the, the union management relationship works is to sit down and to bargain, to talk with one another. And the town would give up the right to suggest what, um, what part-time could reasonably be. The other thing I would suggest is that when a labor union submits a bunch of names, they don't necessarily know how the town operates. They might not know that in calling out clerks, that that doesn't just include permanent part-time clerks, it includes substitutes who might work one hour a month. So um, I realize that when you read literature or you look at the way bargaining has historically been done, it has been very much um, a negative thing. Um, labor unions form for all sorts of, of reasons, and I'm not going to get into why that might be happening here. But I can tell you that when it works, it works um, best when both parties sit down, form relationships, and negotiate. Um, I, I can't imagine, for example, hiring or putting, allowing um, an individual who's not even an employee 
to be covered under a collective bargaining agreement because now I have a non-union person doing union work, which would cause all sorts of problems, especially in an environment where you can't hire that position these days. So um, I get it. I, I have said publicly before, um, this is not about liking or non-liking, busting or not busting. The quality of the first contract that we get is absolutely instrumental in how the relationship is going to move forward. And allowing a lot of hyper-diversity, um, not understanding what the overall implications are, um, will cause problems as we try to manage that contract in the future. Um, I guess I'm just gonna stop there. Other folks who may want to give comment or ask questions? Sure. Sure, why not? Um, Claire, can you just identify yourself for the camera? My, my name is Claire Ackroyd. Um, and I'm sorry if you don't want repetition, but I would like to add my voice. I am here to, you know, uh, to, to, to agree with, to support and corroborate basically what Mark said and to add the possibly repetitive thought that I suspect that the letter you received from me is one of the ones that is being accused of being based on poor information. I base it only on the information that I had access to. And if that is not good information, I don't see that that negates the whole idea that I am trying to address. Um, if the information that I'm receiving is poor, then get me better information. And if I need to just wait till that information is available, let me know that too. And I would like to, rather than be told that my homework was inadequate, I would like to know that you all accept my, our comment as done in very good faith with a genuine concern behind it. Um, and I don't think our perceptions our perceptions on the details may be wrong, but our perception of the sense that there is a culture at the town office, and again, I could be wrong, but if I am wrong, then tell me how and why. Uh, there's a culture at the town office that is not, does not have the indications of a settled, happy, and collaborative communicative workspace. So I want the, I would like to, um, I'd like to know whether our letters will be made public. Are they a matter of public record? They are. Off the wall, they may be. Mm -hmm. um, everything will, will everything all, you email to us is a public document. Will we all get a response? Yes. I, I, I raised specific questions, which I would love to have a response to. Just yes. Have to be here. Yes. And I have to, you know, and I apologize that folks who did email us did not receive responses back. And the reason for that is because we needed to have the executive session with our attorney tonight to make sure that we didn't say anything that we weren't supposed to say, basically. Um, and so we held off on responding to any of, we received, I think, 12 or 13 emails over the weekend. Um, and we have planned to respond to them but we're holding off until we could have a chance to talk together and with our town attorney to make sure, again, the council has a responsibility to walk a fine line and stay out of commenting in a way that could be construed as opposition or support. And it's important that we think about that. So, so we needed to have that conversation. So yes, you folks who did email us will be receiving responses. Finish my thought. Um, I, I, I very much don't want to leave here feeling like my presence, my comment, my concern has been dismissed because of some inaccuracies in what my perception of the situation is. I want my good faith time and effort to be recognized and met with good faith response. I want to know that my, my concerns are not dismissed as coming out of left field and therefore not worthy of considered response. Huh? We, I, I do apologize if that is the perception that you received. It, I can't speak for every counselor, but that's not my feeling. Um, we were all 
receiving these emails and I was personally taking them very seriously. Um, I don't personally feel, I'm not dismissing the content of those emails. And part of why we wanted to arrange this meeting the way we have tonight uh, was to be able to give space and acknowledge that folks, they have a lot of thoughts to share and we want to hear from the community. We also want to make sure that you do have the right information. And again, the timeline of this was very rapid and we couldn't say anything back to you until tonight. Um, so this is also an opportunity, again, not dismissing anybody's comments because they had the wrong information, but having an opportunity to provide you with, with information that might clarify things or, or help. Maybe just, I would like to clarify, I just reread the letter, but your first point is regarding an employee, which I don't think any council is going to respond back. We're not to allowed any, to. Any yeah. comment about an employee. So just to clarify that. I, I understand that. I believe I said that, but the, um, without responding to the specific case, the situation that led to that, which re reflects a environment, I think is something that can be addressed. Using that only, I mean, there's no point, in, you know, I don't mean to get into a silly argument. I, I barely know what I'm talking about. But <clears throat> even if the individual case cannot be discussed, the situation underlying it is something that I believe can be addressed. Not, Do you know, I'm, least, I'm and, curious. And as, as part of your should, ongoing business. I don't know if this should be a back and forth or not, no. but I am curious. If, I. I Feel like the attorney did address that? Are you? Do you not feel that the attorney addressed kind of what you had in your letter? You do. You feel that it, that it hasn't. No, been no, no. That's very useful to be here. It's exactly why we're here. So maybe, yeah. Just, just trying to clarify. Other folks, I thought I saw a hand. Um, Sarah, I want to make sure folks who haven't spoken have a chance first. If you. Yeah, I'm Harrison Goldsteel. Um, I understand that uh, in the state law, there's no fine line over full-time or part-time or what part-time is in terms of eligibility to be a part of a bargaining unit, right? But the town of Orno, do you have actual delineations between part-time and full-time employees? Are any of the employees like labeled part-time? And what, what is that? So we have um, a full-time employee who works 40 hours a week. We have um, part-time employees who work um, less than 20 hours a week. We have part-time employees that work more than 20 hours a week. Um, the 20 hours being a delineation of whether or not you qualify for benefits um, and prorated benefits. Um, we also have per diem, which means you just when you're on a list and if we need you, we call you. Um, so you might not get called for a month and then you might work 20 hours a week for a period of time, depending on what your needs are. Thanks. Sure, go ahead. Uh, my name is Wesley. I was just wondering approximately how sorry, many- Sorry, I'm sorry. Can you say your first and last name? It's for the record. Wesley Berry. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering approximately how many uh, positions in each uh, category you had, and um, if you were actually uh, planning on making them uh, separate themselves into those groups, depending on how many uh, you guys have. So I'm not planning on making anybody do anything. I'm planning on having a conversation to figure out what kind of makes sense. Um, and when you say delineate like part-time per yeah, diem. Like roughly how many full-time employees? Um, so we Nine. have approximately 12 full-time and that would be in the covered class. Um, be part-time, but I also think depending on how you read it, there is another four Part time that I'm not sure the union realized that they may have picked up, which is part of the issue, which are the per diems. So we're talking about made like uh, we're objecting to the petition because uh, we don't want to put them in the same group. I feel like that's not a lot of people to be uh, 
you know, separate. Oh, you guys have to be part of this union. You guys have to be part of this. So it's, it's not so much how many people, it's more about the classification of people. And I'll give you an example, not this one, because I'm not supposed to be talking about this particular file. Um, but I just got done a negotiation with the police union. And we spent two months trying to figure out how to reclassify a detective who had been written in as a covered employee, even though that detective really wasn't a detective, they were a patrol person. And we needed to change the way detective was looked at. So because the word detective was accepted in as a list of covered employees, it had an unintended consequence as we tried to manage the unit. It took us two months not to come to the re realization that something needed to happen, but to hammer out terms. And once a union gets that um, covered class, that is really important to them. And for, for a variety of reasons, along with the type of work that the town can have done by union people versus non-union people. So understanding if part-time per diems are covered, that is a different classification of employee that gets much different benefits and much different expectations. Um, to cover them without discussion doesn't make a lot of sense. Sure, go ahead. Hi, I'm Shailene Morris. Uh, this might be kind of a silly question, but I have no background in public policy. What is your guys' next step from here? Like, I understand you guys have done your filing part. People here have their own problems with everything, but what happens next? Because, like, I don't, I genuinely don't know. So, in the next week, it is the next week, it's next Monday. Um, Matt, the town attorney and I have a meeting with the executive director from the labor relations board and the union representatives. Understand this is the first time that we will meet the union representatives or have any conversation with them. And uh, so we first enter into a discussion about um, kind of each other's points of view using their petition and our response as a baseline for that discussion. Town is not allowed to raise things that are not in their response um, at for some negotiate we can negotiate that out and then it just goes to the labor board for certification um, if for example we couldn't come to an agreement if they were dead set that the assessor needed to be part of the union and we didn't think the assessor should be part of the union the next step would be for it to go to a hearing and that's just um, more about presenting facts, it's the legal argument in front of the board, and then the board would make the decision. Town doesn't make any decision here. Thank you. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Hi everyone, Emma Schrader, resident of Orono. I just wanna make two comments. One, thank you for laying out the process, Sophie, we appreciate it. Um, I think there's been to summarize some people's comments, I feel like there's been a general feeling that the town is making too many objections to the union and bringing up too many things. I understand that it's a part of negotiation. I understand that process. Um, but it begins to feel, as Mark said, as, as, a, as a first comment, a little bit like union busting. I understand that it's part of the negotiation process. I get that. Thank you. I also feel that our concerns are being a little pushed aside by saying we don't understand the process of negotiation and um, opposition negotiation. But I think our concerns really are about how town employees feel and how town management isn't necessarily being open to that feeling or the public's feeling here. So I feel like I don't need to comment back. I'm just saying those seem to be the two of the things that are happening here. Um, and it'd be good if council thought about them going forward. So, Emma, the one thing I would say to you is, um, while we are in this stage, I can't talk to my employees about how they feel. That would be a prohibited practice. So we are in this status quo place where 
if I was aware that there was a large scale issue, I could go to council and say, this is what I think the issue is. I'm not aware of what that large scale issue might be. And I can't address what I don't know. And I can't ask those questions until we are through the certification process. Hey, go ahead. Yeah, John Weldon, and just, uh, I don't want to make this back and forth, but I guess totally understand where you're coming from, Sophie. Um, just to build on that with Count a little bit, I think we're letting you know how town employees feel. So yes, you know, you know, we understand you need to talk to them about it, but as members of the town and having, as members of the town, we have an interest in the process. Um, it seems like in your interests, it might be worthwhile knowing what we know as well. Yep. Anyone else? Sarah? Um, hi, it's Sarah Marks. Um, I just have a couple more questions. I really appreciated all the information and clarification. Thanks. Um, my, my question actually is, I don't know if I fully understand. I understand that um, the idea that less similar employees makes the union more complicated to deal with. I get that. I guess I just want to be clear. If all those objections that were put in by the town were all accepted by the labor board, does at that point, would that mean that there's not enough people to be able to form a union? Would we effectively have divided into such small groups that there isn't one? Or does the town see a clear path that you could separate these professional and clerical or part-time and full-time or whatever other distinctions you're asking for. Do you see a clear path where you end up with four different unions that meet all those categories or two? Can someone speak about that and answer that and what that would look like? So in our petition, we specifically say our concern is clerical and professional, but we also go on to say we also think they can be split. So as part of this process, the town doesn't know who has signed on or not signed on. So I have no idea how many people have signed on. I don't know who they are or what position they would be in. I am, we are making um, our objections either for discussion or um, because of statutory reasons or because of that professional clerical, which is defined in the law. Um, without honest without caring how the how it breaks breaks down based upon um just the numbers within the unit and how it would break i believe that we're going to have a labor union um or two by the time we're done but it could be two or it could be one and if it was one would the other half be excluded at that point if it ended up only when i say or only when i say one or two, I mean, we'll either separate clerical and professional or we'll have yeah. one. Yeah. I have a second question, but if someone else wants to go first, by all means. Go ahead. Um, my last one I've been trying to figure out has been, um, so I heard the lawyer, maybe he's not there anymore, um, speak about it being management who would handle all of the union negotiations. And I'm a little, confused on that also having looked at the ordinances and policies and it seems pretty clear to me that the public entity that can accept a union or not is council not management and it also seems fairly clear to me in our ordinances that management is supposed to be doing day to day and council is supposed to be doing anything that's strategic and longer term implications and so maybe I'm missing something and I would like some clarification because it seems to me like whether we have a union to negotiate with into the future is more of a strategic long-term issue, not a day-to-day -day management issue. Um, is there a law or something that you're citing that's saying that management is the public entity somehow here and not council? So Matt, I think the question is about council's role or lack thereof in the process legally. But specifically, what law we're citing or what ordinance we're citing about that? It's an interesting question because it's a mixture of both management and strategy, or you know what the policy goals of the town are. So I, I won't opine on what might happen here, 
but this type of uh, labor issue is an employee issue and that comes under the town manager plan that statute that that gives the, the that the council through its charter and ordinance have, has directed that um, that responsibility to the town manager but in a, as a practical sense the town can include um, members of the select board on a bargaining team uh, once once this is all sorted out that that sometimes happens uh, most times uh, um, the council wants to stay above this just or just and they just want to talk about it on a policy and budget um, level and then direct the the, the um, management to carry out the negotiations so while a member of a council or two could be on a bargaining team typically that doesn't happen it's you it's uh, direct the professionals in the uh, management to uh, carry that out that's that's how it typically happens i don't know if there's been a decision here made because i think that's premature i think i think the question is more about the process if i understand correctly sarah I'm which is in statute. I don't have that role, the statutory reference. Can someone send that to me later? I would yep. love to know. Yep. Can you, can you, just to clarify, you, you said something about who can accept the union. Did you, did you say yeah. that? Because it's I don't think just I, my understanding is it, it can happen regardless of anything, right. anybody on this side can, if can you look say at or do. Look at the statute, it specifically says such requests for recognition may be granted by the public employer. The first option says it may just be granted. It doesn't even say anything about the majority cards or anything. It just says may be granted by the public employer. I'm curious who the public employer is on that. I assume that's council. That's the statute. Oh gosh. I can look at the number. MRSA 1 MRSA 26. 9A967, I believe, but I can send it to you, Neil. I'm just trying to figure out the process. I think what people have been saying is more clarity about the process and what statutes exactly are being referred to would help people to understand how this is going to go forward. That's what I'm asking about. Thanks. Do you want Matt to answer that question or? If he can, or he can email later if he can't answer it now. I mean, I don't know. I don't mean like citing the specific statute, but whether council is the public entity and accepted. sure if he knows that from that statute I quoted. I just I, I saw you shaking your head Matt so I didn't know if you knew if you had a uh, I already answered the I had already answered the question that the council through its charter and ordinances has already directed the town manager through the town manager plan to handle these these type of uh, employee issues. Uh, but it is a cooperative uh, once once a, a union is formed, then the council and the, the manage, manager will be working together. So this varies from how school does it, which I, I'm probably sure you're um, here. When I bargain for the other units, go into an executive session with the council, share thoughts, get authority, go off, I bargain, come back when there are questions. <clears throat> so... Matt, if you have time, can you send just what statutes are being quoted? That would just be helpful for helping people to understand. So, so I think Sophie can do that. Perfect. For you. Okay. I do want to make sure the hour is very late and we do have two items on the agenda that unfortunately I don't believe we can postpone uh, because they're time sensitive. Is there any last comment that anyone would like to give before we move on to the next item? Yeah, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> And I guess I'm curious, you know, not knowing the law as, as detailed as everyone else maybe does, but is there a scenario, you were mentioning the negotiations, so is there a scenario where the car, the cards or the town employees could have brought the union effort and then it just goes into negotiations through the main labor board without any opposition from the town, like any, any is is, is it possible that that could have been a scenario? Because I think so, it sounds like you're concerned about later negotiations, but my understanding is there's a mutual third party that would <clears throat> mediate those discussions when the time comes. 
So my understanding, and Matt can correct me if I'm wrong, is that had the town not posed the objection to some of the statutory issues and asked for the discussion about part-time employees and the two different classifications, then the Labor Relations Board could have just approved what they what was submitted because we're not raising an objection, which would have caused some, some consternation in terms of, as I just gave the example of the assessor. So just to clarify, there's no, there's no, there's no opportunity for that to come later when you enter into negotiations. No, because you're certifying a unit, that unit is covered. I can't then negotiate people out of that unit. That's what this period is for. Sophie, there's a second way that could have happened, and that's if the petition had um, not included positions which are statutorily excluded and had specifically said that given a definition of say part-time employees that would the town would have found acceptable or co-aligned co with what you already have on your policies then in that situation the town may have looked at it during the 15-day review period and said we've got no objection here that didn't happen Okay, um, for the sake of time, and also we have some staff waiting uh, for the other items, I do wanna move on to the next agenda item. I also wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight. I'm glad that we had this opportunity. And again, we do intend to respond to the emails we received. Um, please do reach out to us if there are follow-up questions. Obviously, this is a, it's a big subject. We wanna make sure everyone feels heard. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for coming today. Um, moving on to the third item. Do we wanna just take a minute and sure. talk about the rest of the agenda? Sure, <laughs> sure. So as much as I will be unpopular with folks who came in on their day off, um, I wonder if parking really is super time sensitive. I know that we worked hard to get a presentation together for you, but um, it's almost eight o'clock and, yeah. and folks have to be up at six to be back well, before six to be back to work. So I'm wondering if I could excuse my folks who are here from parking and have Kyle and Mitch talk about floodplain because that is super time. That sounds like a good idea. I agree. <laughs> and also my my deep and sincere apologies, gentlemen. I'm very sorry. Thanks for coming out tonight. I do look forward to hearing what you have to say on this. Absolutely. We'll be back. <laughs> Great. Uh, moving on to item number four, Comp Plan Implementation Committee. I will pass the baton to myself. Uh, item A, proposed revisions to the Town of Orno Ordinances, Chapter 18, Land Use Article, Roman numerals, geez, floodplain, <laughs> floodplain Management for Compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program. So before Kyle starts, I want to abbreviate maybe some or just put it out there that um, the reason that this is coming in front of council is because the National Flood Insurance Program has changed its map and we were given very specific guidelines on how we needed to change our ordinance. People received um, the draft that Kyle is proposing and now I am going to turn it over to Kyle. So yeah, um, FEMA manages the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, as part of that, there is the creation of the flood insurance rate maps. Um, if you noticed in our current ordinance, the map that our ordinance currently references is from 1978. So sort of been a long time coming to update those with better elevation data and things like that. So I think that effort's been going on for some years now. And um, basically in July, they're ready to have effective new um, floodplain maps uh, to go off of. So with that, 
becomes necessary to update our ordinance regarding floodplain management standards that's housed in our land use ordinance. Um, our existing language and what's being proposed here is based um, entirely off of the state model ordinance. So there's the National Flood Insurance Program um, within the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. There's a state um, coordinator for that program. They have different model ordinances meant for different regions, depending on what sorts of um, flood zones are in the area. Um, so that updated model ordinance was provided to us. The state sort of tailors um, our existing ordinance, and then they brought in all of the small updates that have kind of happened over the years. So, um, you know, we went through just to kind of see what over the past 20 years had been added to our ordinance and what you know, what were new things. Um, so that's in the draft. The things highlighted in yellow would be um, new changes. Um, but that being said, um, like Sophie sort of referenced before, um, those changes are to meet FEMA's guidelines for development in the floodplain. We have to do those. Without doing those, we can't be in compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program. And therefore, people in those parts of the town wouldn't be able to have flood insurance anymore. So um, this isn't really one of those situations where we have a, a lot of say in the matter, but that being said, uh, it still has to go through the normal ordinance process. Um, you know, when you look at the changes, most of them are kind of clarifying either new forms or new forms of data, um, where certain elevation data can now come from, um, you know, the obviously the most notable changes referencing the new maps. Um, there are a couple new development standards to follow. I mean, typically, you know, what you think of is, you know, if you have a residential structure in the floodplain, it has to be, um, you know, a foot above the base flood level. That now applies to things like utilities as well. So there's some, you know, sort of minor additions like that um, that would now be included in the ordinance and, you know, reviewed that way whenever one of these projects came forward. Um, overall, the process would be, you know, if council is okay sending um, the draft, which is really, again, just the, the state model ordinance that we were provided, um, it could go to planning board public hearing at the April meeting, it could come back to council public hearing in May, um, with potential adoption in June, and that would allow it, the ordinance to be in effect um, by that July 19th when the new maps go into effect. So we would have that uninterrupted compliance with the, the NFIP. So I'm happy to go into you know, more detail about any of the specific changes, if there's any questions, but that's sort of the general overview. I have a question, Kyle. So when the flood, when the flood map, when the floodplain map changes and there are people that are located along that floodplain, do they have to purchase insurance, like flood insurance, no. if the, if the map, if the map is, has changed? Um, I assume so if they're brought into that special flood hazard area. I'm not sure how many cases there would be of that though. I, I'm thinking like Penobscot Street or, you know, some of those, and I haven't, I don't know I'm tired, so I don't know what the map, how the map is so the, laying out. Yeah, so the one thing is that map dates back a long time before right. the, before the dams were Came down. Right. So I think, if anything, it might help. Right, yeah, people. that shouldn't be a worse. Okay, or the basin. Yeah. Um, how would people know that they suddenly were included and had to purchase flood insurance? Yeah. I could reach out to the state coordinator about that because I'm not entirely sure um and you only get flood insurance through fema right yeah yeah um was there a map i could i didn't see a new map so that was like a jump scare leo what did you do <laughs> <laughs> oh you see it's me yeah, oh, we'll it's in our, yeah we went in our minutes i mean the, the new map is available right. yet, which is what some, the letter that was part of 
I think what, what went to you kind of reference some communities having hesitation adopting an ordinance before the map was actually out and about for people to, to see. Um, that's why they referenced making the effective date of the ordinance adoption, you know, July 19th, when the map goes into effect and would be. Um, that being said, you can go to um, main.gov slash DACF slash flood, and they have a link to the digital flood map on their site. It acts very similarly to like the town GIS map, um, and people can see on their so they, so they wrote our rewrote our entire ordinance and they couldn't send us a map. Yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> well, that's rude. <laughs> so what we will be able to do is um, remember this is committee, so it will go to public hearing when Kyle has got that established. Um, we will have the link on our website along with the draft information um, there so people can go and look. But right now, there's a link on the agenda for today that takes you to the ordinance and the letter, which is all that we have right now. So I've got a, a quick question on page six, section G, where it talks about physical changes. It talks about development projects requiring a uh, professional engineer to determine their impact. I'm assuming we don't have that capacity as a member of our town staff. So who bears the cost for the engineering? If, so if I want to put in, if, if I were lucky enough to own waterfront property and wanted to put in a new levy or something, there's the cost of the engineering. So that's, I believe that's under, I mean, that would be something the applicant would have to be provided as part of their development plan, whether it's going through permitting through the code office or planning board review, that would be part of like a site plan review process or something like that. Um, I guess that was my question. Adopting this ordinance doesn't require us then to provide this service. No. no. And what we would do because we would, like we do with all planning board issues, we have a um, consulting engineer that is on um, staff, um, on we contract with to, to review all of those planning board applications. Um, when an individual makes an application, they put an escrow aside to pay for the few the hour or two that that will take, and we pay out of it and return whatever money we don't use. Even in addition to that, there's always room for the planning board to ask for additional studies and things like that. But, but yeah, this would be all of those development standards it's always on the applicant to show that they can meet the development standards. In the Other questions for Kyle? Doesn't sound like this is a decision, really. <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> Not much choice here. It should be noted too that this is the, this model ordinance meets the minimum standards set by FEMA. So the town could, you know, if any community desire to make stronger standards um, in floodplain zones, they could potentially do that. And, you know, we could submit those through the state office and they could have that discussion of whether, you know, it stays in compliance, things like that. But yeah, becoming less strict than what's provided would, would probably be a tough or impossible. So, so we are expecting is I didn't is zones A and AE are those already existing zones or are those additional zones being added? Are we expecting because that dams out now dams are out that the flood that that it's going to shrink the, the flood zone or expand or do we have any? I don't believe it changed much because so several years ago when I was fairly new still they reached out to the community. Um, code officers and, and things like that to, you know, I mean, it says in here, the code officer admin, administers this ordinance and, and all that. So they reached out to, um, I think, code officers in similar positions in the region. They had some drafts of the maps that are going to be in effect um, and asked for any information. You know, if there weren't a lot of changes, I think, based on what the map currently had we brought up 
the fact that the dam had been removed as one of the things that you know to look at and consider you know are there any differences here that would make that floodplain area smaller and less prohibitive um, I don't remember there being any major differences there though <laughs> So the next step is public hearing. So because this is land use, we have to call it first. So we would call it this month um, for next month. We would have the public hearing. And at that point, we would render the map somehow. And um, that public hearing um, in April and then May, we would either go back to committee if there's a comment or go for adoption. Um, it does give us one extra month that I'm building into that because I get nervous and I don't want to have people without insurance that that just, you know, I don't want people in a bad position because we decided to look at it a little more. All right. So moved. Feels good about that. Um, okay, thank you, Kyle. Um, item number five is another session of public comment. Can I just add just one quick thing? Because normally we'd have the manager's report. I do have one item that I need. You'd to like write. to give public comment? Go right ahead. Yeah. All right. I'd love to give some public comment. Um, I have been approached by the Orono Public Library Foundation. Um, they are making a request for congressionally directed spending. Um, to help fund or help their fundraising campaign for an expansion at the library. We would very much like to be able to support them in that. Um, it will take a, um, a letter of support that would be stronger if we had a resolution supporting it. So I'd like to put that on the um, new business to um, go through. I don't know that there will be a ton of other information, but um, don't want to put a resolution on um, the agenda without having pretty good sense that we're going to generally support it. Yes. <laughs> and would this be for this month? Yeah, it's, it, everything is due on the 14th. So we'll, I'll write the letter of support and write a brief so this won't be like a long resolution that we publish. This will just be a short resolution that I can refer to in my letter of support that council took formal action supporting. Tom, did you have a? Oh, I think I, I didn't agree. know. <laughs> just out of agreement. Okay. Um, any other public comment before we adjourn for the evening? Thank you, Mom. Thank you. <laughs> I will take a motion. So moved. Oh. All in favor? Oh, we should let Tom. <laughs> Bye, Tom. Bye, Tom. Bye, Tom. Put on your sunscreen. Don't. <laughs> <laughs>